Does your answer depend on who's asking? Or your feelings? Or your circumstances? Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Our scripture text this morning takes us to a mountain where Jesus handpicked three of his disciples to climb this mountain with him. The same story can be found in the gospel according to Matthew and in Mark's gospel as well. Same story. Those are called synoptic stories or the synoptic gospels, virtually the same recorded evidence, if you will. We heard this morning about Jesus climbing a mountain and taking Peter, James, and John with him. They climbed Mount Tabor, which is some 1,886 feet above sea level. How many of you have ever climbed up a mountain or driven up a mountain trail, perhaps? Several years ago, Donna got the wild idea to go hiking. She was born and raised in the Poconos, so she's a kind of a mountain girl. While, while we were in our beloved Berkshire Mountains in West, western Massachusetts, she came up with this idea. We tackled that day Mount Greylock, which is 3,491 feet above sea level. Donna loves to hike and discover things in nature. She told me that day that if we make it all the way to the top, it will be well worth it. And I remember her saying, and the view will get your attention. Hmm. The same was the case when we visited the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon for the first time. But others have climbed much higher mountains than that. I started researching some stories about mountaintop experiences for this message. I, I can tell you now that I have had several mountaintop experiences now in my life. One that comes to mind is driving all the way up Vail Mountain, 11,570 feet above sea level on business many years ago. What was interesting about that trip was that it was 93 degrees in Denver when I started up way up the mountain. When I arrived it was 43 degrees with snow on the ground. On that occasion I did not prepare for the extreme temperature drop and was not clothed properly or ready for that experience. I learned how unprepared I can be some days in my life. How many of you know how many people have climbed Mount Everest? Anybody have a guess? How many people climbed Mount Everest? 29,029 feet above sea level and the highest mountain on earth. Well, 4,000 people have climbed Everest with the first being Edmund Hillary and Tenzig Norgay in 1953. They asked the famed climber George Mallory why he climbed Everest, and he replied, and remember this answer. They said, why did you climb Everest? And he said, because it's there, simply. Because it's there. Over 4,000 people have climbed Everest and all have their story to tell. The same was true of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all telling the story of Jesus at the mountain of transfiguration. But Luke tells us the why of the mountain. Jesus takes these three men up the mountain with him. He went up to pray, and as he was praying, his face became altered and his clothing, his cloak, turned a bright, dazzling white color. Jesus was showing these men who he really was. All of a sudden, 
Two men were talking with Jesus, as we read. Those two guys were Moses and Elijah. Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets. They both spoke of Jesus' trip to Jerusalem, his departure from this world, his death, his resurrection, and his ultimate ascension. This jaunt up the mountain was done at night, so Jesus' radiance, friends, could really be seen in all his glory. When I stood at the top of Mount Greylock, I felt accomplished and certainly acknowledged the power of God and his majesty. The the claim to fame with, with Mount Greylock is when you reach the top, you can actually see the skyline of Albany, New York. Big deal, right? Well, it's true. You can. (laughs) You can see the skyline. Now, why, friends, did they have to go up a mountain to pray with Jesus? Why did Jesus want these men to go to a mountain? Why? Well, we can conclude that that was just Jesus' reason. But why did Peter, James, and John have to go? Because wherever Jesus went, they went and wanted to be. But Jesus had other reasons far beyond the thinking of these three mortal men. Can you imagine yourself climbing a mountain and walking side by side with Jesus? In Matthew, we are told that Jesus was transfigured before them with his face looking like the sun and his clothes becoming white as light. Maybe an advanced viewing, perhaps, of the glory and the power of the risen Christ. Maybe of the second coming of Jesus. Peter wrote this later in 2 Peter 1, where he speaks firsthand of what he saw. He reported that these things happen and are not made up stories, he writes. While on that mountain, he, Peter, saw firsthand the the majestic splendor of Jesus with his own eyes when receiving honor and glory from God the Father. Jesus' identity was revealed to these three men. Peter reports that this trip up the mountain revealed his authority as an eyewitness and the inspired authority of Scripture to prepare the way for who? For us. His words about false teachers. Peter became empowered by what he saw. Jesus took these three men up the mountain for some real show and tell for their eyes only, so to speak. On the top of that mountain experience where their own eyes could take in everything that their sheer obedience rewarded them to even climb the hill with Jesus. They were rewarded. How does the Lord God get your attention? How does he get your attention? For those that successfully climbed Mount Everest or some 29,000 feet in the air or six miles above the earth. In whatever their perception was at the time when they started their climb, they discovered it indeed got their attention that you can only last 15 or 20 minutes at the top of that hill until you run out of oxygen and can die. Not only that, but the weather can change so quickly, so drastically. In Scripture, whenever God wanted to get people's attention, it would seem he took them to a mountain. For example, in Exodus, after God brought the Jews out of their slavery in Egypt, he told Moses to bring them to Mount Sinai. While there, the Israelites were treated when God came down from that mountain with a cloud filling the sky with thunder and lightning, and he spoke with great authority. 
so much so the people stood. They trembled. Hello? God is speaking here. Our lives and the way we live them at times will will contradict our faith. You say, Danny, sometimes I need to use just common sense for a solution. Okay. But common sense is not faith. They are seemingly as different as Oswald Chambers describes as our natural life versus our spiritual life. We should stand on a mountaintop each day when we allow our common sense to override our faith. Common sense, at least speaking for me, cannot always be trusted. How do we truly trust Jesus when our own common sense doesn't trust him? When my theology becomes clearer than God's, I have a problem. Are we willing then to stand on that mountain and say, I believe that God shall supply all of my needs and walk back down that mountain with that same conviction because that is when our true faith begins. When I run out of gas, when I run out of gas totally frustrated and my strength is gone, friends, my ability to see clearly is blinded. Blinded! Will I endure this trial with victory or turn back in defeat? We're told, we're told a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Two great men, Moses and Elijah, were each there because God planned this whole thing out, friends. He had them there to make a statement. God was stating that although Moses and Elijah were important and important enough to be on that mountaintop, they ended up disappearing into the mist. Where did they go? Why? Because while they were both faithful servants of God, it is Jesus that is the Son of God, and He is the Savior of the world. That is, Jesus possesses God's full power, His full authority. Therefore, His word should be our final authority. God wanted these three disciples and us to never, ever forget that Jesus had all the credentials to demand from us that we listen to him only. Philippians 2, 6 and 9 says this, Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. But when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a, a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all names. Jesus was and is God. And putting all that aside, he came down from the mountain and died for our sin debt and to supply us the forgiveness we need to be saved from hell. Like Moses on Mount Sinai, 7,497 feet. And Elijah on Mount Carmel, 1,791 feet. God was saying essentially, you can listen to me 
Or you can get off this mountain because I'm not sharing you with anyone. God is saying the same thing here on the mountain of transfiguration, Mount Tabor. This is Jesus, my own son. Listen to him. Don't try to make him just another teacher or prophet or some morally upright leader. He is more powerful than every great leader, including Moses and the prophet Elijah. Peter later says, and is documented in Acts 4 and 12, that salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Adhere to him. Listen and learn from him or get off the mountain. In essence, that you cannot be saved, friends, by Buddha. That you cannot be saved by Muhammad or or Moses or Elijah. This mountaintop experience shaped the faith and saved the souls of these disciples. Never to be the same again. Ever. Alone. (laughs) On the top of this mountain, Jesus had their attention. Have you ever stopped to think why Christians seem to need more encouragement than any people on the face of the earth? You wonder that? There must be a a reason for that, you ask, and there is. Because we are one nation where Satan lives according to God's word. And we are one world where Satan looms. That's why. Anyone who is a real and true believer in Jesus Christ is actually following the most hated person in the history of the world. You say, wait a minute, Danny. I always thought of Jesus as being the most loved, the most appreciated, the most sensitive, the most kind, the most articulate. Well, that's all true. But consider the majority of people in every generation that have rejected him. Consider how many have called him a liar. Think of how many have doubted his every saying. Think of how many, including academics, teaching in seminaries that have questioned some facet of his teaching. Jesus took these men on top of a mountain to get their undivided attention. In all his Radiance and glory to comprehend his point of view. His father's love for him sounded out in words to completely comprehend that they need to return off of the mountain and teach people. That this point of view is why being a Christian is not easy. But very hard and very worth it. They asked President Kennedy at a press conference when he announced that the United States was going to the moon. They were going to put men on the moon, he announced. They shouted at him and asked him, why are we doing this? They said it was too expensive and it was too hard. Kennedy responded by stating, we are not going to the moon because it's easy, but because it's hard. Jesus needed these faithful men to consider his words first. His divinity and his leadership before any other mere mortal would. He needed these men to do things that will be hard and that would challenge them. Because Jesus was omniscient. He foreknew That Peter, James, and John would do the hard things to bring the lost and the lonely and the hungry and the naked and the sinner and the hypocrite to him. 
for forgiveness and salvation. But he needed their complete attention. Let me close with this. Bruce Larson writes in his book, What God Wants to Know, that during the height of civil war, President Abraham Lincoln often found refuge at a Presbyterian church in Washington, D.C. He would go with his aide, he would sit with his stovepipe hat in his lap and never ever interrupt the meeting because the congregation would be disrupted if they knew the president had come to sit in that midweek meeting. He sat off to the the side near the, the pastor's study as the minister would open the scriptures and teach God's word and lead congregations and worship. The war was tearing the nation apart, tearing his soul apart as well. Having just lost his son, Lincoln was on the bottom, and he needed solace, and he needed sustenance. As the pastor finished his message and the people began to leave, the president stood quietly, straightened his coat, and took his hat in hand and began to leave. The aide stopped Lincoln and asked, What did you think of the sermon, Mr. President? He said, I I thought the sermon was carefully thought through, eloquently delivered. The aide said, You thought it was a great sermon? Lincoln responded, No. I thought it failed. He failed. The aide asked, He failed? Yes, said Lincoln, he failed. How, Mr. President? Why did the aide fail? Lincoln said, because he did not ask us to do something hard. He did not ask us to do something great. God is asking you and I to pay attention to him, to clear our heads of all the clutter, to climb a mountain if we have to in order to gain clarity of just who he is in our lives. And then climb back down that mountain and do things that are hard and do things that are great. In Jesus' name, grow in your understanding of exactly who he is, friends, and take to this the world around you. Take it to the world. Clarity begins with your mountaintop experience with the Lord Jesus. Do something hard. Do something great. Move. Speak. Live Jesus. Amen.